Hey, 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 Char <laughs> hey Charles. Yep. Hey, Charles, we're live, Charles. Yep. We're live, Charles. I see your uh, Shari sign. Who is Shari? Share. Share. Oh, share. 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 Share.com. Hello, hello, oh. everyone. All right. Welcome, Start welcome. Which party? Welcome, welcome to this beautiful morning. Yeah. Rhonda Morris, the first one on. How's that? We had a very, very well informed. Too bad it wasn't done sooner. Too bad it wasn't done sooner. But aloha, everyone. Today is Monday, the 6th of July. I'm Uncle Charlie Yona. On the other side, there is uh, Uncle Mel. Thank you for joining us on Facebook. Aloha. Yep. Aloha Friday, everybody. Aloha Friday. Hang on, hang on. I got a, I got a call from. Hello. Hi. No, I'm. Right now, you're on Facebook Live with me. I cannot get you on the show, but at least I can get you. Everybody's watching me talk to you on the phone right now. <laughs> I cannot hear you. I can't. You want me to put you on speaker? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, okay. Hey, hang on. Charles, yes. I'm going to turn it over to you, Charlie. There we go. Sure. Let me, let me mute myself out here. Anyway, if you have the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, I humbly ask you right now to please share this uh uh, share this, this Facebook live session that we're on right now. Okay. And right now there's 59 of you on today. Uh, what can we talk about until Mel comes back? Well, last night, as you know, we had, uh, let me take off the light here. We had uh, our guys from Shopo and uh, both Ternary Ma'afala and Malcolm Lutu. Uh, today was a vote. And unfortunately... Um, it got passed. So uh, there's there's some other things in the in in the in the works, and hopefully that can be done. Because again, uh, what's going to happen right now is that there's some other things. Let me turn off my volume here. What's going to happen right now is that uh, you know why 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 is the police department being targeted? No one knows. But hey, guess what? Now it's a free for all. So every department, I think it's only fair that their departments as well be put out in the spotlight should they have an infraction, which is not criminal because the bill, again, it doesn't address criminal. It's for anything. So the officer, uh, you know, standard of conduct, maybe he didn't salute properly because, you know, each department, they have a protocol that they have to address senior officers or ranking officers. And if that protocol is not followed, which is not criminal, but it's like uh, not paying proper respect, not saluting properly, whatever, person gets written up, get, guess what happens? It's gonna be put out, it's gonna be put out there for everybody to know it. For what purpose? I have no clue. I have no clue. I, I'm so, really, really surprised and disappointed that the legislature overwhelmingly um, supported that bill uh, I and I, I'm not going to mention the names because I didn't go look at the docket uh, but yeah. we will announce the names um, maybe on tomorrow's show or once I get confirmation uh, it, I didn't have time to to go pull it up but you know this again is an example of how the politics get involved get in the way of, of rational thinking because listen an officer gets in trouble they go through the process, and we're not talking criminal. We had that discussion last night. Some people said, well, you know, the regular public, they get arrested, their picture. That happens for police too. Uh, if you get arrested, if a police officer on duty or off duty gets arrested, then it's, it's public record because the arrest is public record for everybody. But this, right. was, this was everything else. This was your, your internal investigations on whatever the case may be. And all, all, the way the law was or is until the governor signs this, 
is that you allow the officer to go through due process. You know, he gets his hearings, he gets all of his uh, evidentiary hearings, and then at the end of the day, if he's found to be uh, his actions to be inappropriate or against the standards or the policies of the department, then the name can be released. And I don't think that's too much to ask. I think it's fair, uh, understanding that we talked about this last night. Officers have a second, split second to make a decision and they make mistakes, they're human. But to go out and, and uh, blast their names out uh, prior to them having their fair uh, hearings and internal processes is simply not fair. But again, just another example of what, what I call the knee-jerk reaction so that the legislature can say that, you know, we did something in this whole ridiculous nonsense of uh, what, what Black Lives Matter or whatever the case may be. You know, all lives matter. Police lives matter. Blue lives matter. Everybody's lives matter. And, uh, you know, in Hawaii, we don't, we talked about it last night. We're not like the mainland. There, there's a whole different culture here of respect and aloha that, that the, the mainland. I love what Tanari said last night. You know, we're always chasing the best practices of the mainland in everything we do. Everything we do, look at the rail. You know, that's from somebody else, it's someplace else. It doesn't work here. Uh, why not turn that around and say, hey, all of you guys that's having problems, why don't you follow the best practices of Hawaii? I think that was the best quote of the night uh, when Mr. Maafala said that. Yep. Yep. Well, you know, like anything else, things happen for a reason. But uh, no use, uh, no use getting an ulcer over it. You gotta find means of how to counteract something like that. You know, it's the the, the vote has already been taken. Now it's it awaits the, the governor's signature. And if the governor we'll doesn't sign, the governor does. We'll see what the yeah. governor does. Um, you know, hopefully the governor doesn't sign it. Hopefully he doesn't sign it, and and it doesn't and it doesn't get to law. But you know, with those numbers, even if the governor vetoes it, uh, they probably have the numbers to override the veto. So, you know, it's something that they're going to have to deal with. Just one more uh, obstacle, mm -hmm. one more deterrent from getting our local boys. For uh, higher uh, applying for the police force, one more thing to make it more difficult or more unattractive for our local boys and, and girls to uh, men and women, I should say, to become yep. police officers. Yep. But you know, we we again, I think Tanari said last night. You know, when you go vote, and I'm not suggesting that you 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 use a one issue to sway your vote one way or the other uh, for any candidate. But look at the voting history. Look at the issues that are important to you and your family. And then go check the voting history on all of them, no matter where you live, whatever district you're in. And do some research, do some homework. Because, uh, you know, every we, 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 we get the same issues every single year. And the outcomes are usually the same. So, mm -hmm. um, Yep. But anyway, tonight we have uh, an amazing show tonight. You know, we have... We, today you saw the reports again, Hawaii, statewide we have seven cases, but wait, Kauai, I got to say again, props to Kauai, the county of Kauai, our mayor and his administration, we get the accurate info. You, you guys notice that? We get two cases today, the state puts out their, their release right around noon. If you look at the report, it says all numbers as of 12 o'clock noon today. But then we, the county um, announces that we had two cases that they found out this morning. So I don't understand that part. So again, that's why I stopped posting the state's numbers because it's not accurate. And today was proof of that. But we got two more cases today. And then the, the, the governor's press conference today, the Lieutenant Governor, Dr. Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson is starting to at least say that he's concerned but when you, when you listen to the governor and the lieutenant governor, man, it's full steam ahead. We're going to open up. And we're going to open up using this one pretext. And they're not even have, they don't even have that process is locked down yet. They, admittedly, they, they admit that they don't have their processes. They anticipate certain things happening. And tonight we have three doctors on. We have Dr. Lee Evslin. Uh, most of us know Dr. Evslin. We have Dr. Michael Schwartz. 
from uh, University of Washington and Dr. John Elderetti, also from Kauai. Uh, and we have former councilwoman, former mayor, Joanne Yukimura, who was part of that Kauai discussion group. And they're gonna be, do you think the governor is opening prematurely? Absolutely, absolutely. Not, not so much prematurely. I wish he would lock down the, the safety and the security for the residents that live here in Hawaii before it opens up. I, you know, I think they had ample time. I think we've, we've gone up four months now. I think we did have ample time to put together a program. And that's what tonight's show is about, an alternative. Um, we have three of, of a few more doctors. We had Dr. Izaki and there were Dr. Weiner. They were part of this group. But these three uh, were able to come on tonight and they're gonna talk to us why, what, what started the Kauai discussion group. And I think you'll be shocked to see the numbers and the statistics of why they believe a two test, six day quarantine period will, will make it much safer and we can open up and reopen our economy, which we all want in a safe way. So I, I, I cannot wait, I cannot wait. Um, we all know, I know Dr. Evson, I don't know the other two doctors personally, but it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna mm -hmm. be interesting. And it's just about that time. So why don't we bring them in, Charlie? You ready to bring them in? Sure. Boom. And here they come. There's Dr. Schwartz. Hey. There's Councilwoman, or former Mayor Joanne Yukimura. And that looks like Dr. Alderetti. Uh-huh. And Dr. Evelyn is missing in action right now. <laughs> but anyway. Hey, thank you all for joining us. Dr. Schwartz, where are, you? where are you? Are you in Hawaii? Yeah. Okay. I'm at Kauai. Oh, you're on Kauai? Yeah. Oh, okay. And Dr. Alderetti is on Kauai. I am. And Joanne Yukimura is on Kauai. I'm here. Well, welcome aboard, ladies and gentlemen. I, we, we, we're so glad. We're just talking before you guys came in how exciting tonight's show is going to be. Talked a little bit about... Um, after watching the governor's press conference today, it's pretty clear that um, it's, 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 they're moving forward to open up on August 1 with what they uh, perceive to be a safe method. And, and I think for most of us, uh, I can tell you, most of us on this show, I did talk a little bit about your, your plan uh, a, a several, about a week ago, and I put up the chart from your plan. And uh, I got to say, it was probably 100% satisfactory rating from the viewers that they approve and agree that we need another plan. So I'm not going to take any more time. I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, oh, oh, there's Dr. Evelyn. Hang on. Hey. Hang on. Okay. There he is, Dr. Evelyn. Hi there. How are you doing, Mel? You know what is amazing? Hi, Doc. You know what is amazing, Charlie? We got four guests tonight and all four came on and their audio was working. <laughs> well, you know, because they, they didn't want to get one of these, you know. They didn't want to get one of these. <laughs> you know, they, please unmute your audio. They didn't want to get one of those. But Charlie anyway. had to make cards because we, oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So what I'm going to do real quick again, uh, former mayor, former council member, Joanne Yukimura, Dr. Michael Schwartz, Dr. John Elderetti, and of course, Dr. Lee Evslin. I'm going to turn it over to, I'm not sure who, who's going to, if you could just say a little bit about yourself and then maybe one of you can explain how the Kauai discussion group came about and uh, where are we going from here? We know that uh, you guys had an opportunity to meet with the Lieutenant Governor. Maybe you guys can talk about that. It's an informal session. We have thousands of people watching this. So our theme is really simple, inform and educate. And um, we cannot wait. So whoever, whoever, take it away. I think I'll start. Um, thanks so much, Mel and Charlie. Good to see you, Charlie, um, for, for having us on on tonight. And um, just brief introductions. Well, Dr. Evelyn needs no introduction, but um, Bill, you want to say a few words about yourself? Or? Um, hi, everybody. So we came to my wife and I came to Kauai in 1979. Two small children trailing behind us uh, came from Guam, where I um, worked on a neonatal intensive care unit with doctors from Kapiolani. And they said, don't go back to Maine, come to Hawaii and 
see if there's a job you want there. Anyway, they said the Outer Islands are always looking for pediatricians and Capulani was looking also. Anyway, we came in 79, we thought we'd stay for a year and 41 years later, we're still here. Two kids were born at Capulani at Wilcox after that, then uh, nine grandchildren came after that, five of them born at Wilcox. And during that 41 years, I served as CEO of Quai Medical Group, Quai Medical Clinic um, for 15 years. I was CEO of Wilcox Hospital after HBH, um, after the merger with HBH. And then when I left administration, I my final years in practice was a small practice in Kapa um, as a pediatrician and uh, actually seeing all ages because I was actually trained in adult medicine too. And then after that, I got put on that pesticide task force that met for a year and a quarter, and that was quite an experience. And since then, I've been playing with grandchildren, writing a book, writing a column for the paper. That's it. <laughs> well, welcome. And thank you. You yeah. took care of our son, uh, my son, my, my wife and I, uh, our son, Baron, you took care of him as well. So thank you, Doc, and welcome. Thanks. Uh, we also have a very unusually a virologist living on Kauai. And uh, John, you want to say a few words, Dr. Eldoretti? Sure. I am a, a microbiologist PhD by training, but did my work in virology in Seattle, actually, at the same institution that Dr. Schwartz is from. Uh, I am here with my family as we're watching our son try to navigate uh, school and reopening with this pandemic, which is uh, quite frightening as a parent. Um, professionally, I, um, among other things, uh, my company based in Seattle develops uh, diagnostic tests for infectious diseases, and we're quite active uh, with this virus as well. Uh, so I have uh, a lot of stake, both personally and professionally, with uh, the progress that is being made um, or, or not being made in this case. And uh, I had the fortunate pleasure of uh, having uh, engagement with Joanne, who asked me questions about virology, and that's how my uh, involvement uh, began. And I think we're incredibly fortunate to get uh, Dr. Bothet Lee Evelyn and Michael Schwartz involved as well. Thank you, John. And then uh, Dr. Schwartz, about yourself, you're part-time resident here, right? Yeah, part-time on Kauai. I, right now, I've been here almost all year, actually, with this pandemic. Um, I am a physician and a scientist, and I've been with the University of Washington. I did my advanced training there, so going all the way back to uh, the early 1980s and um, became a full-time faculty member maybe 25 or 30 years ago and have been a professor of medicine doing both patient care and research at the university now for 15 years or so at the professor level. And uh, so I split my time between the Seattle area and Kauai. Uh, we have a home here in Moloa and <clears throat> Like everyone else, I was quite concerned about the uh, pandemic as it was developing and uh, about the unique situation that Kauai and other Hawaiian islands find themselves in, in that they don't really have to worry about people from neighboring states just driving into their area. They actually have a lot more control over their borders. And that was what allowed us to have such a great initial response to shut the virus down. Uh, until a couple of weeks ago. And so I actually didn't know Joanne at all, but I read one of her articles, I think back in March or April that she wrote in the Garden Island. And she had ended that article saying, if you have any comments or want to reach out to me, here's my email. So I just sent her an email and she brought me into the rest of the group. And uh, yeah, we've been working together now for two or three months. Thank you. I, I just knew Joanne was the instigator of all of this. I just knew <laughs> she was. <laughs> Actually, Mel, it just yeah. started like you and all your viewers, like wanting to know more about the COVID virus and, and this being such an unprecedented experience for all of us and then wanting to protect ourselves and our families and our community. That's how it started. And so I would when I started tapping the brain of Dr. Eldoretti and Dr. Evslin, and then that's grown into a, a group of people like your group that, you know, wants to make sure we're going to be safe as we reopen. So that's how it started. And, um, and I guess I'll just say something generally about 
our report and then uh, call on uh, Dr. Schwartz to explain the biology and the basis of our report. Um, we're just basically a group of concerned citizens. Uh, we're fortunate to have some scientific expertise to draw on. Our bottom line is safety because we don't want our families to get sick and suffer. I mean, I think always of my 96 year old mom and my four year old granddaughter. Uh, and we don't believe also that, sorry? Oh, and we don't believe um, either that we can get sustained economic recovery, which is what we all want too, um, without um, containing the virus. And we don't want to um, open up and then have to shut down again because that will hurt our economy more than ever. So the best way to stop the virus, um, to contain it is to stop it from coming into the islands. And Dr. Schwartz referred to that in terms of um, our really unique opportunity to control it at our borders. It, because every COVID case in Hawaii came from a chain of infections that began with an incoming traveler. Although at some point we can't trace it all the way back, but that's where it started. And so um, we think we can do this with a well-designed science-based screening process that involves two tests and a six or seven day quarantine. Um, we understand that there are practical problems in imp implementing this program, but we don't think they're insurmountable. And we think if all the stakeholders, the visitor industry, the workers, the Department of Health, the first responders and enforcement agencies, the airport division, um, the mayors and the governor's office and the healthcare industry and the business community, if we all got together, we could probably figure this out. Um, and we really appreciate the effort of the governor and the lieutenant governor, all that they put into the existing plan. We think um, that the proposal for a pre-boarding test is a big step forward, but there's still so many unanswered questions about that plan. And also as Mayor Kalkami pointed out, the situation has changed so dramatically since a month ago when the plan was being put together. Um, that it looks like we need to relook and uh, really make sure we have an airtight plan to keep our community safe. And I'm, of course, I'm referring to the explosion of cases on the mainland um, where we're telling people to come from, in, including uh, returning visitors. So with that, I just want to ask Dr. Schwartz to explain the biology and the of the virus and the basis for our conclusions. Uh, he drew upon UW resources, which, you know, they too are part of addressing the, um, the epi, one of the epicenters in the country. So um, his connection has helped us a lot. Yeah, it, being, being a member of faculty at a major academic center has its advantages and it allows me to call on people who have unparalleled expertise and dealing with this type of problem. And so, you know, they don't live on Kauai, but I spent a lot of time here and I'm invested in the community and had the opportunity to, to tap into them to develop this model. So um, the, the upshot, I think I can explain fairly simply the problem with a single pretest. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the test. There's nothing wrong with the idea. The problem is that by definition, if you understand the behavior of the virus, once you've been exposed to it, a single test can at best only detect two thirds of the cases and one third of the cases will not be detected. And the reason is that if you kind of run the numbers, once you've been exposed and you're infected, you don't actually start shedding the virus where it would be, where it'd be picked up on a test for about four days or so. And then in the average case, you'll continue to shedding the, shedding the virus from the fourth day till about the 12th day, at which point on average, you'll stop shedding the virus. So of the 12 days from when you first were exposed and now have contracted the virus to when you stop shedding the virus and would test negative for that reason, well, only eight of those days would you actually test positive. The other four, you're gonna test negative. 
So there's nothing wrong with the test. It's just that the virus hasn't shown up yet in your body in a way that can be tested. It's incubating. But if you're going to come to Kauai and you're incubating a virus, it's going to become infectious while you're here. And that second test is designed to pick that up. So if you add the second test and a short quarantine period, you go from allowing one third of the people capable of spreading the disease to enter the island down to less than 5%. So you can dramatically, almost tenfold, reduce the risk of someone coming into the community by simply adding that second test. And that is what our model shows us, and that's what it's based on. Doc, doc do you have your, um, you have that chart available? Uh, yeah. If you wanted to feel free, um, you can share so, your screen if you have it. Just click on the share screen. Yeah, I did. I, I put it up um, uh, last week and. But, well, it uh, says right now, it says, it, it says that's disabled. So I think you'd have to allow me to do that. There we go. I think you should be able to do it. Yep. Okay. Is that working? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this, this basically shows you, um, this is from our report and what it shows you is that, um, it based on the model, the way it's structured, if we assume that 1% of the arrivals will be infected or be able to spread the disease while they're here. And that, in my view, the 1% number is probably low, but we didn't want to use, start out with a high number and be accused of falsely uh, exaggerating the threat. So we started with a low number uh, of, of 1%. And so based on that, out of 10,000 arrivals, so you know, I think if we're ramping up, I mean, the normal number of arrivals to Kauai in a normal business is about 3,000 a day. And so even if you only had one third of that, 1,000 per day, in 10 days, you'd have 10,000 arrivals. So if we just use that number, uh, that's what this is based on. And 100 out of those 10,000 would be among those who want to come to the island but are capable of spreading the disease. The first test will pick up two thirds of those. So now you're down to 32 and that's what that number is. If you let people in or you, if you did the second test right at that time, you'd still be at 32 because your numbers aren't really any different from the first test. And then with each passing day of waiting to do the second test, you can see that you're capturing more and more of those individuals and allowing fewer of them to enter in uh, to the community uh, with the virus. So that number goes down from 32 to three if you do that second test on day seven after quarantine. So that's this is a basically a biostatistical model that takes the information that's available about the, the percentage of the population that we think is gonna have the disease that's coming to Hawaii, and then the information about the disease, the behavior of the disease in the host which I just talked about, and then just spits out the numbers. And that's what this is showing us. So basically from 32 passengers down to five in the case of a six day quarantine. Correct. Wow. All right. Now, the at the current state that we're hitting, the, the one pretest, up to 72 hours. I understand there's an attempt now to even extend that to uh, maybe four days, but just with what's being presented, the three days, we we don't see a very uh, safe window. I mean, it's it's we're going to catch some of them, but a lot of them will be, be able to come through with a negative test and, and still be carrying the virus, correct? Yeah, and, and the numbers, I, I, I gave you the number of one third. It's actually a little higher than that because the one third is the number that would test negative even though they uh, had it, but they were still incubating it. Um, 
But in addition, there are people between, you know, if they get tested three days before they travel, well, some of those people are going to pick it up after the, their first test. And you won't know about that either until they get here. And for example, on the flight or in the airport or something like that. So that actually pushes the number up closer to maybe 35, maybe even 40 percent. I don't you know, it's hard to know for sure. We don't have hard numbers to go by. But the point is that the one third number is actually an underestimate. And it only applies if the one percent um, infection rate is accurate, too, right? Well, the percentage is going to be the same, but the absolute number that you're seeing here in this chart is dependent on what is the what is the number of people with the disease. So if people are coming from Los Angeles, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a lot higher than 1% or Phoenix or Houston or Dallas, a number of major cities. Um, I don't think their prevalence is 1%. I think it's probably closer to 10% in some of these places. Like Vegas, which is a very, uh, because this, this also works for residents that are going to the mainland yes and then coming back so we have a lot of a lot of uh, residents here that go to vegas go to california a lot of uh, us we have our kids that are on the mainland in hot areas uh, that so it would apply to residents going away uh for vacation or what have you and then coming back this quarantine or this two test model would would should still be in place for the returning residents as well, correct? Correct, yeah. Let, let me ask you a question, you know, based, based on your model here and say right now the, 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 the traveler or the visitor, wh whether it be uh, returning residents or um, visitors from other states and say the numbers ramp up higher than what is anticipated in the opening. Do we have enough test kits to <laughs> test all those people for the that secondary run here in the islands? Because right now it seems just trying to get a test on the front end, everything is like on this reserve list because they don't, run, they don't want to run out of test kits. But now if, you, if you're talking about the numbers that you were talking about in 10 days, having 10,000, it's like, whoa, what, what do we do? Yeah, I, I think that is an obstacle. Joanne mentioned that you know, there's a lot of hurdles that you would have to overcome to get the plan to work. And it's it's really a matter of having, I think, the political will and, you know, the resources. And just as an example, um, one of my colleagues at the University of Washington runs the virology laboratory at the University of Washington. And when I was speaking with him about this, he said, you know, we have excess capacity. They have, they have the biggest operation in the state of Washington mm -hmm. and they're running 10,000 plus tests per day. And they could take on some of our capacity if we asked them to. And, you know, I said, well, you know, if the governor or the mayor or somebody like that asks me, I'll, I'll be happy to get back to you. Uh, that hasn't happened. So I think, I think there are political reasons why there's inertia against going off state or going to another country and dealing directly with them to get your test kits or something like that. Um, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't happen to me. So I, I, you're right, it's a lot of tests. The other point I would make, and then I would hand it over to Dr. Alderetti because he's actually in this business, is that there is something called pooling. And what that means is you could take all of the test swabs from a single household, for example, and you pool them together and you send them to the lab and the lab just runs one test on all of them. So it's only one test. You only have to pay for one test. If it's negative, then all 10 of them were negative or however many there were. If it's positive, then you go back and run each one individually to figure out which person was positive. But that way, since the vast majority of people are not going to test positive, you could reduce by several fold the total number of tests that you actually need to run every day. You still need the swabs, okay? Uh, so that is an issue. We're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of swabs being used fairly quickly. And so you'd have to have a pipeline for doing that. And that is an issue in other states, but it's not necessarily an issue in other countries. 
and you know it's just a matter of if you decide this is what you're going to do you have to figure out how you're going to do it so dr schwartz said uh perfectly what pulling was uh, i participate in with my company on weekly calls with the fda uh, and i can tell you that there is a lot of uh, momentum moving towards pulling as a way to increase throughput of testing since uh, testing is a limiting factor in helping to control the spread of, of this virus. Uh, and that's a very easy fix uh, or addition, I think, to a, a testing protocol that can be done uh, quickly. Um, I w Mel, I'd like to talk about the um, getting test kits itself, but I just got a um, text to ask us to remove the screen, so the screen sharing, unless we think we want to keep it up. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I, I, I did real quick. I, I wanted to, you know, we've had uh, private doctors come on. Dr. Miskovich, Dr. Um, Tripkovsky both came on. They run private testing out of their own um, businesses or their own uh, facilities. And, and um, they, they don't have that concern, although like the state does as far as the, the, the conserving our tests, that there is the ability to get a lot more tests done uh, in Hawaii than is currently being. You got to go out and buy the test. You got to go get the test kits. But uh, I, I think I think the state has a different position there. You know, they conserve their test. They don't want to test as much. But like you said, Doc, I think regardless of what the we got to make a decision and it is the political decision. If we want to make it as safe as as safe as possible, then it's going to come with that additional cost. It's just the way it is, um, and the risk is too high to not not go down that road. I mean, there's no better way to detect the virus than to with an accurate test, and so to try to do it just with 14-day quarantines, um, you know, to ensure that there's no virus, is a really handicapped way to go about it. You just need a lot of test testing to be able to do the kind of detection you want to do, and um, Actually, um, when in early on when test kits were the issue and they're becoming an issue again with the large infection um, explosion that's going on on the mainland, the, uh, I actually tracked down Daniel Day Kim of uh, the actor and, and he helped us make a connection to a lab in South Korea. And they, you know, um, it, it's, and, and we have so many connections to Asia, Hawaii does, whether it's Japan or South Korea. And over there, I mean, test kits are like flu, flu test kits. There's no shortage. There's no possibility of shortage. They just have so many. And of course, the other idea, which is a little bit more far out, is that we begin to talk about how we could manufacture those test kits on Kauai or in Hawaii. Um, that is the possibility of diversifying our economy. And like South Korea, the first epidemic or pandemic, I guess, 10 years ago, they really learned from it and they started giving up their manufacturing and their lab capacity, their local lab capacities. So, I mean, long range, we could think about doing that. Doc, Dr. Evzen, I had a question for you, Dr. Evzen. I'm, I'm yeah. pulling these questions off of the from our viewers, but one of the big hey. concerns is the capacity, uh, medical capacity at our hospitals, uh, emergency rooms, I mean, uh, IC units, ICU units, ventilators. Uh, we don't have that much capacity here in the state, much less here in, in Kauai. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is a major issue. I I did listen to that. I think you did too. Listen to the press conference today with Josh Green, and you know, at this moment in time, our capacity looks pretty good, even as we compare ourselves around the country. But we can't put somebody in an ambulance and drive them five hours. We got to deal with this ourselves if we start having surges. And I'm, I remain very concerned, particularly on a place like Kauai, that we could exceed our capacity quickly. We do have surge capacity, you know. You stop doing elective surgeries, you start using the ORs as backup rooms. Um, there isn't any doubt that we do have some capacity that's bigger than just our ICUs, but it's scary. I mean, and particularly on a place, you know, Oahu is one thing with the number of beds they have. 
uh, but still per their population, surges can overwhelm everything pretty quickly. So yeah, I have exactly, um, and the other thing that I've been watching with interest is Alaska. So Alaska went to this one test system June 5th, and they also had relaxed social distancing basically in June. And it, looking at their graph is fascinating. So they would be very similar to us and they're also a distance, you know, so they have some control over their borders. They are having 40 active cases um, basically in the end of May and by the end of June, so one month, they were up to 400 active cases. And then I started following them July 1st. So today they're up to 600. So they went up another 200 in the last six days. Wow. And every time they talk about one of the states that's taking a major jump, it's you know, Alaska has joined that group. And I know that their contact tracing has, you know, their system is not doing nearly as well as it was originally just from being purely overwhelmed. So I think it's really important for us to watch Alaska because they're so similar to us. Well, you know, we, we, on had Dr. We, we had Dr. Kimball on from Utah. He was here on a few nights ago and uh, he's also a part-time resident here. He uh, was part of the North Shore Urgent Care Clinic um, getting okay. that started. Mm -hmm. And he told us, this was what, what really made me think when he said, you know, he said, Mel and Charlie, two months ago, we were just like Hawaii, two months ago. And now we're chasing New York's numbers. Two months. Yeah. No one expected the, the, the surge to hit Utah like it, it's happening right now. And that, that's, I think, what people's got to understand, that this, this virus is not something to play with. You know, I, I, I sort of saw something, you know, just listening to uh, Dr. Schwartz and even Dr. Alderady with, with their comments. You know, like for a, a local guy like myself trying to understand this thing, um, and, and you said it at the beginning, Joanne, my, my personal stake is because my brother died from it in New York. Yeah. He died on April 5th. And that was the first time we knew about the uh, coagulation, the blood, because when I got the call, he, he spoke to me on a Sunday. And he told me, you know, brother, I got COVID, but I'm going to try to all this thing because I've been having a high fever for three days. And he went and did the test and he said, but, you know, if I can, they'd say, if I can run this thing out, then I'll be okay. Well, Monday, I didn't get any call from him because Monday he was admitted. So Tuesday, I get a call from a girlfriend and, uh, and she's telling me what the doctors are saying. He says, hey, we're going to have to dialysize him already. So that's what they did. They put him on the dialysis. But then that failed because his blood started to thicken up, just, just couldn't pass through. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I guess for us here trying to understand, and I think why, you know, we talk about the political will, is that because we're not faced with numbers like what the mainland is faced with, they say, hey, we, we've been doing a pretty good job, so, you know, you know we, we can handle open it up. But, you know, right now we're, we're talking about low numbers, but... It's, it's almost like a crapshoot once it opens up and you get these high numbers coming through. And like what Dr. Evans said, because I was metal back myself being a, when I had open heart surgery from KVMH. So I know what, how long it takes to get over to Oahu, but you know, we don't have that luxury anymore. Once, once the numbers start coming in, I mean, how many medevacs do you have if you run out of space here in Hawaii? So I, I think it's this kind of stuff trying to, trying to educate the, the psychological aspect of all these people who think, eh, this thing is on hoax because, you know, they did it, they got it, we don't have it. The, the question is, yeah, they got it, but we don't have it yet. You know, you forgot to add the word yet at the end of that sentence because, it, Dr. Evans, I, I have no doubt, you know, you, you know, Mel told me about you making contact with your friend that's a health officer in Alaska and how those numbers jump. Now, those kind of things worry us. They worry us a lot. Oh, for sure. I mean, they did jump for two reasons. One was probably the opening with the one test. It has lots of issues kind of embedded in it. But two, they did relax social, the social distancing. And that is kind of what we're seeing around our island too, or around mm -hmm. our state. What I also meant by transfer is at some point, if we really surge, we're going to fill all the hospitals with capacity. Mm -hmm. And then we're done because you're, you know, we're not going to fill jet planes or chances are we're not going to be filling jet right. planes with patients to send them to LA. They do have the ability to disperse in the mainland in ways that it's, once we hit capacity, we really don't have that. And the, and the surges are sobering that we're seeing everywhere. I mean, Texas was so sure that it was ready and it is, it's really horrifying what's happening so quickly there. 
Um, so taking your challenge, Charlie, to try to make numbers have meaning for our people, you know, the, the, our study shows that with one test, and that one test has to be pretty good, and there's a lot of questions with that one test right now, but assuming it's really accurate, it's done well, and most people can get it before they come, that still means that 32 people per 10,000 will, right. um, will be coming into Kauai undetected for, you know, every 10,000. So if it's a thousand a day, then it's, um, what is it, times 30 days in a month, right? Yeah, about, 100, about 100. So it's about, well, about 100 mm -hmm. per month of people with, uh, that are positive and contagious coming in um, undetected. So the question is, how do we track them? Because um, people are saying we're going to manage the, you know, the infection. And we can see the issue with just this recent outbreak, which I think came from one infected person coming into the island, mm -hmm. or maybe two, because they haven't been able to track the source. But even so, they, they've had to do over a, a, a hundred people people we've had to contact, right? And out of that has come, is it 20 now infections? Mm -hmm. So from two infections, there's 20 infections. From 100 people, if you just use that, that's 200 infections? Well, this is the problem we've always had here on Kauai. <laughs> and that is, we've always asked, you know, because we had this HIPAA, I mean, we had this issue with HIPAA. That, that's, that's been thrown in our face so many times. And, and like Mel and I have said, we told the Lieutenant Governor, I don't want to know the person's name, but I want to know if that person was eating at Rob's on this day between this certain time, that person is going to give the contact tracer a known name. But that person is not going to be able to tell who was sitting right behind them. But if they would have let the general public know that this person was eating at Rob's, we could probably monitor ourselves and say, you know, I was there and I ain't feeling well right now. Maybe I should go get myself in there instead of just putting them out, you know, in yonder and, and, and infecting people. That's that's always been our problem with this program. Because they say, what's so bad about saying that the person was at wants, okay, on this day between this time? And if you were there, it says, gee, I was there. Could now now you, you ask yourself, could I be asymptomatic? You don't know, but the thing is, you're trying to contain this web, right? Mm -hmm. Because right now the web is so small and you know, both Mel and I being ex-cops and being investigators, we're always asking ourselves, gee, if we won't catch bad guys, we're not going to only ask one person because that one person may not cooperate with us. We got to go look at other sources. We'll get right. the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're faced with right now. Right. I like the two-step process. And I, you know, I, I wish it wouldn't fall on deaf ears because the more we can arm ourselves with testing, I think the better chance we can have. But like well, Dr. said, we cannot be complacent and start relaxing ourselves because, you know, with everybody getting together, thinking, you know, we all family, you know, we're get together, nothing going to happen. Well, some of the clusters here, that's what happened. That's what happened. happened well, one of the, yeah, one of the obstacles to the two tests, seven day, six day quarantine is that people from the visitor industry has told us, if you have any quarantine at all, people won't come. And I don't know if that's true, but it's something we need to address. And, um, I, you know, I mean, I think Dr. Evslin had some really great ideas about a different kind of tourism and how we could turn the quarantine period into a wonderful experience. Um, and, and we're hoping, you know, we, uh, we really want the visitor industry to step forward and help see if there's a solution to the problem because I know that they don't want their guests or their employees to be unsafe. And if there are people coming in undetected, um, they're gonna have a really hard time in their hotels. You know, so how do we, um, and, and maybe some of your listeners have some ideas about, about that, but that is one of the obstacles we're gonna have to problem solve well we, we we brought on we brought on local five we brought on eric hill 
Mm. And he, he flat out said, you know, if you want to turn a hotel into a quarantine, you better make sure we get the employees trained. And that's why they're asking the hotel, hey, are you going to train the employees? Because you cannot just throw a front day worker and say, okay, yeah. you'll be quarantine master today. And especially if the person leaves, you know, they, they got to know some of the signs and symptoms that, that's going to take place if somebody wants to dig out of there. And, you know, to throw it on the hands of, of just the hotel themselves, <laughs> I don't think it's going to work. It's not going to work. Part of the challenge, Charlie and, and Mel, yeah. is, is that um, right now the standard for diagnosis is PCR, and that has a turnaround time, whether it's one day or you know five days, doesn't matter. So there's mm -hmm. still a need to have some time between diagnosis and the result. That's that's a challenge, and of course, quarantining is a challenge as well. But uh, I think it's important for policymakers to understand that things are changing on the diagnostic front. PCR was the front line. We now have two antigen tests, one by uh, Quidel and one by Becton Dickinson. It was just a press release today. Um, and at some point, we're going to have the ability to test on the spot with no delay to results. And this will increase the ability of a state or a county to be able to help manage um, testing in a much more efficient way. So I don't see this as being a single conversation. I would hope that it's an evolving conversation uh, where leadership would understand that we have tools right now, they may not be the best, um, but this is a conversation that will evolve over time. Uh, you, you all had an opportunity to meet with the Lieutenant Governor <clears throat> earlier or last week, I guess it was. And um, China, I know the Lieutenant Governor, uh, he, he's been on our show probably three times now and, mm -hmm. and she's very concerned about uh, testing and, and early on and and now he seems to be comfortable with the direction that the state is going, but what is it going to take uh, for, for us to convince the state that we got to look at, at a model like this one, that in fact, the one test model isn't enough. And then I want to bug Dr. Alderetti as well, because we're getting multiple questions about whether or not this um, virus is, is uh, airborne. Is, is it aerosolized? Is it, is it, you know, we've had several different over the last week. This thing changes so much. We get new information mm -hmm. every day, but mm -hmm. trying to figure out, we, we had a discussion about air, when you're in an airplane, how dangerous it is to, to, without a mask and so forth. But generally, is this a, an airborne virus that can be contracted through the air? So I think, I think there, uh, what you should pay attention to, or any of the listeners should be paying attention to, are the, a plethora of scientists who are beginning to come out and engage the World Health Organization to try to get some statement as to uh, how this virus is actually transmitted. So as a virologist, I will tell you, yes, I think um, uh, air aerosolization and air, you know, transport through the air, transmission through the air is absolutely a consideration. Um, you know, and, and this is one of the reasons why as a, a virologist, I would urge, you know, continuous and ongoing mask wearing uh, and it has to be universal and compulsory. Um, and this complicates everything when we don't have 100% uniformity in use. Um, I was just in Hanalei today. I do water testing for surf rider on my free time, quote unquote. And I saw probably 60% uh, of the group of people wearing masks, large groups of kids playing together, not wearing masks. Uh, this is all gonna complicate everything. Um, I think we're getting complacent right now because it hasn't hit our shores. But uh, the answer to your question, is, Mel, yes, I, I think this is uh, aerosolization is going to be an issue. And um, Mel, to answer your question to me is how you know, which was how can we get our policymakers to look more closely at the safety of the various alternatives and proposals? Um, you you know, thank you for having us on because I think the more public knowledge there is about it and understanding of the reasons why we, why a second test is so important, um, I, I think that will be the way to get our policy makers to listen because out there in the general public, people are so concerned and they're concerned because it's about their family. I mean, Charlie, I'm so sorry about your, your brother. Um, but, you. you know, it's, um, 
it's about our loved ones and our, our loved community. So um, I, I think the more we get the word out, the better. And I also wanna say with respect to what Charlie said about Eric Gill and the visitor industry workers, one of our suggestions is a quarantine hotel that everyone would be quarantined in one place, even vacation renter, a vacation rental guests. I mean, that's one way to keep track. It, and it's much easier to keep track of them all in one place. Um, mm -hmm. And where the, the workers are specially trained and specially equipped to do it safely for themselves as well as because not everyone who's quarantined is going to be infected and you wanna prevent that infection from happening in a quarantine hotel. But just think about this for the hotels that are not quarantine hotels, because once the visitor leaves the quarantine hotel, um, the hotels can be pretty sure that their guests are okay and they don't have to be so concerned about this mix of undetected positive infected guests and um, protecting those guests who aren't, you know? So there have many benefits to that schematic if we can figure it out. And I might also say that we did say they could, um, if anybody wanted to find their own vacation or their own uh, hotel, that if, those hotels or vacation rentals are certified by the Department of Health as being able to handle this kind of mix of guests. And they're willing to wear these tracking bracelets that they use in South Korea, then because then we can track them easily with, without having to chase them around physically, then um, that would be concerned. And, and maybe some will think that's a radical idea, but let's discuss it and talk about it because it is about keeping people safe. It wasn't radical. It was just, you know, our attorney general thinks it's unconstitutional. I, and I, we've been talking about this. I mean, we had our Senate COVID committee um, pushing it. We had Senator Kochi uh, even going as far as picking up, you know, using the hotels or the unused dormitories from the college. There was a lot of talk about it, but then the attorney general came and shut that door. But how else? I mean, as we as we move forward, uh, I, I'm going to ask you guys, i put you guys on the spot because I, I want to hear it from, from professionals and not politicians. Uh, I'll shut up. Do you, uh, and we'll start with Dr. Schwartz. Um, do you believe, or are you comfortable with an August 1st opening? We hearing now also that our airlines are going to be uh, taking away the middle seat restrictions and we're going to be packing the planes. Are you comfortable with an August 1st deadline or opening with, right with, now, with, with, with in place. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think that would be the best idea. I'm quite concerned about that. I, I think the way to think about it is, um, you know, there was a rationale for shutting everything down in March, right? There was a risk. We started to see cases. Swift and decisive action was taken. The cases disappeared. We had nine weeks without any cases. Um, the, my view is that the risk right now is much greater than it was in March. So why would you, you know, have a, a plan for reopening that puts things in jeopardy when the risk is actually greater now than it was before? Um, the reason I think it's greater is because if you look at the rate of new infections, not only in certain states like you know, really, I think there's 30 states now that every day they have a new high across 40, the U.S. 40. 40 states. So across the U.S., you know, the, the rate of new cases has gone from 20,000 a day to close to 60,000 a day in about three or four weeks. So when you have a doubling time that is that rapid, you know, that's it's like trying to slow down a runaway train it's really hard to put it back in the box. And those are the people who want to come here and, and, and who wouldn't want to come here. This is a great place and we don't have much disease, but if you don't manage it with, you know, to me in a really thoughtful, careful, scientific way, you open the door to seeing the same things that have happened elsewhere. And I'll just 
pick up on one other point about the contact tracing that came up a little bit earlier. I think the Department of Health or the County Health Office did a great job with mm -hmm. con contact tracing on these two cases, right? So they identified all these other people, they put them in isolation, and the spread seems to have stopped. Maybe not completely, but they had they got a handle on it. Well, that was at a, I'm sure a considerable amount of cost and effort, and that was for two new cases. Okay, mm -hmm. imagine having a hundred new cases. I mean, as soon as you have twenty or thirty new cases, you you've exceeded the capacity to do effective contact tracing and ice testing and isolation, mm -hmm. and then it's truly beyond what you can manage and that's what's happening in states around the country they can't control this thing it's the, the resources simply are not there and you're familiar with this idea of the geometric geometric rise the rate of rise being geometric well once it gets bad it just gets worse it gets worse more quickly and you know i understand there are a lot of people on Kauai and elsewhere in Hawaii would say, why should we be so worried about this? Because we haven't had this problem. And I would flip it around and say, we haven't had this problem because we were worried about it. If, if you don't want to have the problem, you need to make sure that you don't get it. We have the, this one opportunity to do that. And in a couple of months, it may be too late. So uh, already? I'll just, I mean, he, uh, Dr. Schwartz said that perfectly. Uh, just my opinion is under the current testing regime proposal, I don't think that uh, August 1st is uh, something that I am comfortable with. Um, I'll just leave it at that. What I, what I do want to add to that, however, is what complicates this too, and, and I think there are lots of subtleties about this virus that get lost, whether it's the multitude of sequelae that uh, affect people, because not everybody seems to be affected the same. But uh, it is, uh, according to research, up to 45% of people who are infected may be asymptomatic. And that doesn't even include the pre-symptomatic people who aren't caught by testing once. So if we, when we open up the island, we're essentially opening up the island to all the people in the rest of the country, because the rest of the world seems to have a better handle on it than we do, but at least those are who are coming from the mainland are coming from places that have high rates of viral infection. Why would we want to do that? The numbers alone speak for themselves, I would think, but um, that's where I stand. Dr. Evelyn. <laughs> you know, they've all, they've, those two have been so eloquent. I don't have that much to add, except I do a little bit, I guess. <laughs> there was no question we had to shut down when we shut down uh, because we knew nothing about the virus. We didn't have testing for the virus. We knew nothing about treating it and flattening the curve was absolutely vital. And anybody who says we didn't need to do it, that said it was a hoax, that's insane. We're at another phase now. Um, the virus, we don't, know if the, we don't know why the death rate's going down and why the cases are going up. We don't know if those, the death rate's going to jump back up again in two weeks because there's this lag in there. We don't know if that's due to younger people. We don't know if that's due to better treatments uh, or if the virus is changing, but we're at another very uncertain phase here, except we know one thing, it's spreading like wildfire. So for us to open up August 1st with a, with a rapidly changing environment that we still don't understand and when it's worsening to such a degree and we're places like you know the European Union is saying no Americans can come. Mm -hmm. We're a destination that we're gonna just draw them in and August 1st is, for any methodology, I think doesn't make any sense. I do think if we, I'd be fascinated by even Kauai being a pilot for a two test program with a six day quarantine that we really thought out and see how we compare with the rest of the state while we're keeping ourselves safer, while we let our kids go back to school because it's not spread that badly, while we you know, can have an open economy for us that live here, that's highly appealing to me. and. You know, Kauai's always been different. I think we should try to go our own way. Dr. I understand the terrific pressure that everybody's under, particularly the political people and the economic pressures. I'm not trying to minimize them at all. And I actually give Josh Green a lot of credit for, and, the, and the governor too for getting this one test idea even floated and perhaps in place. But I don't think even that's going to be ready August 1st. And I am really worried with the surges of cases everywhere we look. Just to quickly add on to Dr. Evzlin, uh, Dr. Schwartz said something at the beginning of the genesis of this report that has stuck with me. 
uh, and as each day passes, uh, it causes more consternation for me. Dr. Short said something about that we're in a golden window of opportunity to have these discussions and actually do something about this. There is going to come a point, Mel and Charlie, where these discussions are irrelevant anymore. And August 1st is, what, three and a half weeks away, if that? So um, it's right around the corner. Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, in some of the discussions we've had, it almost seems that the naysayers, I mean, I, I call it that way because, you know, I, I really haven't seen any solution coming to the table. It, it almost seems that the way they, they talk now, it's, it's irrelevant. And yet, you know, I, I look at this whole thing as, and I've said this before, sometimes something as with so much common sense for our political individuals, it might be too common <laughs> because, you know, even the Joe Schmo on the road, they'll come on, they'll come on this show and, and they'll send a comment and say, you know, uncle, you know, we see this, why can't they see it? You know, it, it's stuff like that. And that's how I know something's happening. When you get these people that normally wouldn't open up, they're opening up now. And I, I, I think they see something that, you know, that's really, and you know, everybody takes that common sense approach, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm glad that you folks are, you know, being honest with us about August 1st, not, you know, not holding you to it, but it's just that, you know, that's from your, your, your professional standpoint, how you folks feel, because we feel the same. It's just that we don't have the medical degree, you know, we're just two ex-cops that just got involved with doing this show. And then next thing you know, you know, in fact, you talk about South Korea, Joanne, you know, I don't know if you saw, we had many coal. Uh, from oh, South Korea. I heard that, heard about it, yeah. So there's there's another local boy from Hawaii who has a, a, a company in South Korea that develops these kits. And we're, we're trying to see, you know, if, if he's mm -hmm. one of the key players there, if he's willing to come on and talk to us about it. And then, of course, mm -hmm. you know, I, I understand they got Oceanet, they're developing the, the spit cup and all of, you know, all of these kind of things that's happening now. So I think, I think it's very, very interesting. But again, like Dr. Alderetti said, Three and a half weeks from now, it's it's right around the corner, right around the corner. You, you know, one of one of the big concerns, and John, I didn't forget you. I'm going to ask you the toughest question of the night. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the concerns I have is we rely a lot on the numbers, yeah, that we have because our numbers were low, viral load is low, <clears throat> resources, you know, are we got a lot of resources as far as hospitals and, and beds and so forth. But you know the report came out the other yesterday or the day before the, the the national COVID tracking system. They they track all of the states that that uh, test their population, and we were second to the last. Hawaii was second to the last, um, with five point seven percent of the population being tested. Rhode Island was number one at twenty seven point something percent. New York was number two at twenty five percent. Testing testing of their population, total population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we're second to the last. And I, we, we've been talking about this for a long time that, you know, it's very difficult to get a test here. And in the beginning, it was almost impossible unless you had the virus. And Dr. Anderson clearly said it. We're only giving the test to people that we think have the, the virus. We know about the 40% asymptomatic, but it's, it's, I'm concerned because we, we look like we're doing so well when yet we could still have a lot of positive carriers out there. Or we, it, it, since this started, uh, the numbers are, I, I think, low. I don't think, I don't think it's as accurate. And then now you using that to justify bringing in the, the visitors because of the economy. And that's where the question goes to Joanne, the balance. Right, we, we're struggling with a lot of people that are, are not working and we got to get people back to work. I thought we were going to use this time and Charlie calls it scrubbing the virus out of Kauai, mm -hmm. where we could have opened up for our local economy, you know, just work on focus on getting our local economy moving mm -hmm. before we bring in these visitors. Because as I can't remember who was Charlie, who was the guy that said, if we got to shut down again, it's going to be demoralizing on our, our residents. Yeah, I, I forget yeah, what you get. That's kind of the question is how, how do we balance this? How, how do you, you know, you've been a policymaker forever. Um, where, 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 how can we do this and not 
force people into into poverty well no, that's a, that's a really tough question but the bottom line is you have to find a way to stay safe because yes. then you can concentrate on rebuilding the economy and there's all kinds of creative ideas you know from maybe starting manufacturing of test kits on Kauai to um, you know building our agricultural sector so we can feed I mean we still import 90% of our food so we could build it uh, our infrastructure for providing our own needs uh, for our own needs but we have to be safe because if we don't, our economy will be even more stricken and it'll take longer to um, survive if we have to do what states are doing right, right now. Get to a point where nothing but shutting down will stop the virus and then have so much suffering and so much economic decline. So I, I just want to say that a successful screening program is like turning off the water faucet instead of just always trying to mop up the <laughs> dripping water. And, and so if we can find a really good screening system to at our borders so we can keep the virus from coming in, then we can really focus on rebuilding. And there's a lot of ways. It, it takes more than two minutes now to go into that. I'm sure you'll have another program on how to um, build what people are calling a circular economy where we buy and and serve each other and 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 build our businesses that way it's not and i think it, it will include tourism so if we can find a safe way to bring tourists in that will also be a way to help our visitor industry but we can't do it unsafely i, I agree i mean I, I think and we've always said this you know as other countries are closing their doors to the united states because the threat is real, because the virus is real. They've seen it, we've seen it. You know, Charlie's one example. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've seen it. We just had word today that one of our friends passed away uh, with COVID um, mm -hmm. on the mainland. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's real and we cannot even think about restarting the economy. Like you said, Joanne, until we can assure the safety of, of the people. So I, I know, Man, this, I told you this was going to go quick, and this went quick, but I don't want to leave without giving each of you an opportunity. See, what happens with this show, believe it or not, tonight we'll probably have about 1,500 views, viewers, um, but tomorrow we'll have about 3,000. Once we go offline, all the legislature guys go on and they watch, including the governor and the lieutenant governor. They'll watch this later after the fact. But I wanted to give you guys an opportunity basically to – Say what you want, say what you, what, what you want. How do we get across to them how important it is to reconsider the August 1 opening with a single test process? And we'll go backwards this time. We'll start off with uh, Dr. Eslin. Um, okay, a couple things. One, I, you know, one of the things you always hear, this isn't really worse than the flu. Why are we worried? At, why are we really worried? It's only had this number of deaths. That's such a crazy comparison in my mind. One, the death tallies are done very, very differently, and I'm not going to go into them deeply. But just as a physician, I've gone through dozens of flu seasons, taking care of thousands of flu patients. I've never worried about it. I went in, I swabbed them, I stuck the things in the noses. I never wore a mask. I rarely wore gloves. <laughs> That's how we treated the flu. We, you know, we we knew maybe we'd get the flu, but it wouldn't be the end of the world because we had partial immunities and. In later years, we had our immunizations. This is so different. This is so different for the front lines with the manifestations of this that we don't fully understand and the ways that it kills people, not in the classical way that flus do. So one, it's nothing like the flu. And anybody who kind of convinces themselves that it is, is um, they're, they're being illogical. And two, I, I do think August 1st is early, um, just with everything that's going on for any kind of plan. I do think there's credibility in trying to create a pilot where we have a, a, an island or a state that's unique. We are surrounded by water. We really can close our border. It's now said to be legal for us to have a quarantine. I think that we should think out of the box. I do think if I lived in New York or Delaware, I would know you had to open up in some way. It would just carefully open up. But we're really unique. We are a unique, beautiful destination uh, that's kept this pretty well down and we could build upon that unique destination to make a system that's a two test, um, two tests, short quarantine, 
and the idea that this is an amazing place to visit that's almost COVID free and we want to keep it that way. Respect our, what we're asking you to do and we'll respect you as a visitor. I don't think that's crazy thinking. I think that it is a way that we could, we won't have the numbers we had before for sure, but we may have enough to take some of the edge off of this if we do it right and if we don't take no for an answer in terms of we can't do this or we can't do that. We really can if we put our minds to it. And the last thing I'm gonna say is I was kind of reluctantly joining this committee. I didn't think I needed another committee, but I was so <laughs> impressed by the paper that Dr. Eldorati and Dr. Schwartz wrote with the um, help of the University of Washington. For anybody who wants to read something that really makes a lot of sense, it's the mathematical modeling that they've done. And with that, I'll be quiet. I do wanna thank you guys. You're putting on an amazing show. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Dr. Eldorati. It never was the intent of the group. Thank you for the sign. Uh, <laughs> I was that casualty tonight uh, to basically <laughs> tell people what to do. It was the intent of this report and the intent of this committee to essentially start a conversation because back when we started this, we had time to work on it, right? We have literally been yelled at for being concerned enough and competent enough to actually put together an idea that we felt should be discussed. That's it. So what I would like to see happen is to please, whoever watches this afterwards as a, as a thought leader or community leader or politician, can we please just have a conversation around this? We're not having a conversation on this in the halls of power that matter in this state. Put away the egos, uh, put away the agendas and understand that uh, we're really just trying to help the conversation so we help our people. That's all I would say at the end of this show. I really want to thank you, Charlie and Mel, for, for the uh, time and effort putting into this. Thank you. Dr. Schwartz. So I would, I would also thank you guys. It's been uh, enjoyable meeting you and speaking with you and having this opportunity. I think, you know, I understand there's a, a, a very strong tension between the need for economic activity to recover what has been lost there are people who are confronting bankruptcy and loss of a family business. And I'm fortunate that that's not happening to me. And I could imagine a lot of listeners saying, well, if you were in my situation, you would, you would think about it differently. And, and that may be true. But the overarching concern to me is that if we rush into this because of this need, this pressure, we could make a mistake that will make matters so much worse for everybody, including those who are suffering most economically. We have the opportunity to simply take it one step at a time and make sure that we put safety paramount and then we see how it goes. If it turns out that the threat from people coming to Kauai, which is, by the way, one of the things that we would get from our testing program, we'll actually find out. What is the risk? How many people are we actually catching? And if we've gone through, you know, several thousand arrivals and the second test isn't really helping us very much, you say, okay, well, we tried it. We don't need it. Great. But at least you had that barrier in place to ensure safety first. And I think that's the point. And the other point that I would make in closing is based on what Dr. Alderetti said is this is a process in evolution. So within a few months, there may be a better way to do this that would, would get rid of the need for quarantine altogether. So if you could get a very simple test that you could do every day when you arrive for you know four or five days, you wouldn't necessarily need to be quarantined if it was like getting a pregnancy test. So as long as you're being monitored, you know, you could probably pick it up before you had a chance to spread it. So that this testing regime is a process and evolution. And at some point within eight, 10, 12 months, there's going to be more effective treatments than there are now. So the threat of people going in the hospital and dying will be less of an issue that we're worried about. So why not put safety first, take it slow. The process is going to unfold and eventually in a few months, we'll get to a point where we can safely reopen because the threat the threat isn't as acute as it as it is right now. So, you know, based on my years as a physician, you know, that's the same thing I would tell a patient if they were in a similar situation. Don't rush into something that could make things a lot worse. 
Joanne? I'll be quick. Um, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Mel, stop it. <laughs> um, the, I, I just want to say that if we don't do what Dr. Schwartz is saying, do it from a safety first basis, and we get really terribly infected and people die and suffer, you can't take advantage of these new developments um, because you're going to be in such a bad place, both economically and in terms of our health and well being. So um, that's what I want to stress. You know, people still think it's only an older person's disease. I think that we're just, we're learning so much more as it goes along, but it's, it's a disease that our children can get. And, you know, I was so thankful when I first heard that children weren't being affected, but that's not true anymore. And on Kauai and well, everywhere, we love our children. Um, so we don't want it to be a prevalent uh, infection. And then there's also even the young people who may not have serious symptoms, we're finding that there is, could be long-term lung damage, that it's not just also a lung disease, but it's a blood circulatory disease. And so um, there's so much suffering that we could avoid if we create a safe screen around our island and then learn how we to recover and thrive. That's it, Mel. Didn't I do that? Well, <laughs> yes, that was awesome. <laughs> Charlie, Charlie, you got any? I know Charlie. Again, a very personal thing to Charlie, and and condolences again, Charlie. Thank you. Well, you know, I'd like to say first of all, thank you uh, to our guest tonight, because uh, as always, you know, knowledge is 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 a really good weapon. It's a really good tool. If we got to fight the unknown, but just having some kind of idea what we're up against is better than trying to go into it blindly. You know, I will say that, you know, a lot of the people that I talked to, we were supposed to get this gentleman on who was in the ICU for seven weeks. And this is the first time I heard they use ECMO. They use ECMO because he was, he was unable to basically oxygenate himself. So, you know, and then I, I, I started, you know, the, the cardiologist over at Queens, that's what they did. And he was supposed to come on, but I, I understood. And, and the wife just said is, he said, you will never know that, you know, because people comparing deaths to recoveries, but yet recoveries, you have this long lasting health problems that Thank comes you. with it and, and, and it may last forever. So right now he's still dependent on, on, on his oxygen, which, and this guy's a scrappy guy. So, you know, I just want to let the people out there know that, you know, you can recover, but you you may have some long lasting uh, health uh, problems after that, and you know how's your quality of life after that. So I just like to say thank you to all the doctors and Joanne. Thank you so much. It was a very eye opening experience, and I got to see firsthand uh, a, a real good talking group in action. I mean, it made a world of difference for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For now, thanks, Charlie. Now before you close, I just want to say thank you to you and Charlie too. Um, it says, you know, your purpose to educate and inform is so important. And thank you for letting us do that tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you for reaching out, Joanne. Um, you know, I, uh, I hadn't heard about it until you had informed me and, and you sent me the report. That night I read the report and I told Charlie, you know, we got we to gotta get the, these uh, people on. Yes. But we didn't want to. We didn't want to get you guys on and then piss off the decision makers up at the state capitol. Yeah, so we waited. So we kind of held off because, you know, this is has nothing to do with anything other than to inform and educate. You know, we got one shot at this. We got one shot and the time is right now. Uh, somebody posted, Sabre said, keeping people alive is rule number one. That goes to what you were saying, Joanne, about without, with this horrible pandemic, if it should break out over here, there will be no economy. There will be no economy. So we got one shot. We got Friday, we have uh, Minnie Ko from South Korea. She's a consultant up there, but she's, she works with the government. I encourage you guys to, to watch on Friday night. She'll be on talking about, you know, they had, a, they, they had an amazing run and then they had a spike with patient number 31 and then they handled it. But you know, they have, their test is 20 bucks a test. 
they they don't have a problem with capacity. We can learn so much from them. We can learn so much from the other other states and the other countries that have battled with this. And you know, you, I, I you, this is one of the most informative shows I think we've had, Charlie. I mean, we've had so many. I mean, imagine this is like four months every night. So do the math. We've had a lot of them. But this is and based on the comments that we're getting, I hope you guys have a chance to go back to the Facebook page and, and actually look at the comments because it's a ton of positive and thank you comments for, for all of you. This is one of the most informative shows we've had. And we definitely want to have you guys come back as this thing yes. develops to see which way, what hopefully the state will, will reconsider. Um, I really hope they do. I really hope they do. But um, thank you guys. I know it's, it's uh taking time out of your guys' evenings and we appreciate you guys spending the time with us because it's important for our people to know what's going on. And, um, and Mel, you know, I, I also wanted to say uh, just for you as, as well as a doctor, why this is so important for me tonight because we're, we're running a little over time is that I don't have to cook dinner for the wife. I can smell <laughs> in it for me. So thank you. Thank you. Guys. <laughs> you know, Mel, Mel. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, Doc. One last thing. I just, for some reason, I was running the numbers this morning, just in general. I was curious, how is the U.S. doing? We have, we have, we have eight, we have 4% of the world's population and we have 25% of the world's cases and 25% of the world's deaths. That is staggering. And that's the country that we want to open our doors to. That is really scary. You know, <laughs> When, when, like I said earlier, when other countries are, are, are saying no to the United States of America, <laughs> and then Hawaii is, hey, come on, my, come, <laughs> we'll thank you. Something is not right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you guys all tonight uh, for being here tonight. Tomorrow night, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Miskovich. He'll be on to talk about the testing and, and uh, what's going on in a testing world. Wednesday, we have Joanne, we have Jade and Lyndon to talk about voting and the new election processes. And then Friday, we have Mrs. Cole coming back from South Korea. So um, interesting week ahead. Thank you guys again. You guys all stay safe. God bless. Take care. We love you guys. We'll see you guys tomorrow Thank night. You. Aloha. Thank you. Seven o'clock. Aloha, you guys. Stay safe.